Hello, I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University, and I want to welcome you out to our event. I apologize we were a bit late today. We had some technical difficulties we had to work out, but I think we've got them all uh, solved now. Today's event features a distinguished lecture, which will be given by Sir Angus Deaton, who will be speaking on the issue of inequality in America. This is the inaugural event in a, a series that the Foley Institute is hosting this semester on the politics of inequality. Future events in this series will feature Joe Soss from the University of Minnesota, Chris Ferrissey from Syracuse, Amber Wykowski from Marquette, and many others. If you want more information about these upcoming events, please visit us at foley.wsu.edu. And if you miss any of these events and you want to catch them later, you can do so on the Foley Institute's YouTube channel. Before I introduce today's distinguished guest, I want to thank the College of Arts and Sciences at WSU for their continued support of the Foley Institute. And for those of you who don't know uh, much about the Foley Institute, we were established by a congressional endowment in 1995, honoring the service of Thomas S. Foley, who served as citizens in the 5th Congressional District of Washington for more than 30 years and was Speaker of the House of Representatives. The Institute that bears Mr. Foley's name continues his legacy through a variety of programs aimed at educating the public about American democracy and encouraging young, young people to pursue careers in public service. We do a lot of exciting things here at the Foley Institute, and if you would like to know more about our events and programs, you can do so by subscribing to our YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, or emailing us at tsfoley at wsu.edu. Today's distinguished lecture comes at a critical time in American history. Economic inequality has reached levels that we have not seen in more than a century. Last year, the 50 wealthiest Americans had more wealth than the bottom 50%, nearly 165 million Americans combined. Moreover, the pandemic, the Trump presidency, the Black Lives Matter protest, and other recent events all highlight our nation's nagging problems with racial, gender, class, geographic, and other forms of inequality. There's no doubt that the growing severity in both the reality and perceptions of inequality in America are giving rise to populist politics on both the left and the right and fueling American political polarization. To kick off our series on the politics of inequality, there's no better person than our guest today. Sir Angus Deaton is a senior scholar and professor emeritus at Princeton University and a presidential professor of economics at the University of Southern California. He is the author of The Great Escape, Health, Wealth, and the Origins of Inequality. And with Anne Case, Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. His interests span domestic and international issues and include health, happiness, development, poverty, inequality, and how best to collect and interpret evidence for policymaking. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, a fellow of the British Academy, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He is a past president of the American Economic Association. In 2015, Professor Deaton received a Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of consumption, poverty, and welfare. He was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and was made a Knight Bachelor by the Queen in 2016. It's now my distinct pleasure to welcome Sir Angus Deaton to the Foley Institute. He's indicated he plans to speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, and after that, we'll have some time for some questions. If you have questions, I encourage you to send those to me at tsfoley at wsu.edu. Again, that's T.S. as in Tom S. Foley at WSU.edu. So, Angus, I'm going to turn the time over to you now, and I'll come back uh, later when uh, you're finished with some questions from our audience. Uh, thank you very much, Cornell. That's a very generous introduction. I hope I can live up to it. I'm going to share my screen. So um, let me know if there's any problem with that. I don't know where that came from. Um, but you should now be seeing a screen that says American inequality, um, the deaths of despair. So I'm going to talk about inequality, but I'm also going to link it to deaths of despair, which is the title of my book um, with Anne Case. Um, so the question you might ask yourself is why is inequality a problem in modern capitalism? Um, and you know, it's clear that people really care about it. If you ask them, ask people, they say inequality is a really serious problem, but it's not always clear what it means. Um, here's a couple of quotes. Um, President Obama said it was the defining challenge of our time. 
Um, and then he went to say a few dozen individuals. Cornell just said something very similar. Control the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of humanity. That's not an exaggeration. That's a statistic. I love the rhetoric, but it's not entirely clear why we should worry about that. Um, many argue that we should do something about it. Whenever you say a sentence, see a sentence that says we should do something, a really good question to ask is who the hell is we in this and what exactly are we supposed to do? Don Riff, Dan Riffle, a policy advisor to AOC, has said that every billionaire is a policy failure and goes on to say the bigger Jeff Bezos is and Bill Gates slices of the pie are, the smaller everybody else's slices of the pie are going to be. Well, that's true about pies, but the real question we want to know here, is it really true that Bezos and Gates are benefiting at the expense of everyone else? I mean, if you divide up a pie and a bigger bit goes to someone, then there's less left for everybody else, but it's not very helpful. Bernie Sanders has, says that he doesn't think that billionaires should exist. Um, in Britain, there's a somewhat similar concern where inequality has always been more of a concern in Britain than um, it has been in the US until recently. Um, if you look at the data on the income and wealth inequality, it's not so clear, especially on explaining the recent upsurge of concern. So maybe it's something else that people are bothered about. Now, economists like to look at inequalities in income and wealth. So if you scratch an economist and say the word inequality, they'll start talking about Gini coefficients. Um, if you look at those, they've not changed very much over the decade before COVID. That's the sort of period between the Great Recession and COVID. Um, they haven't increased much in the US in that period, and they haven't changed very much within or between countries. Though, as we'll see, all of that is pre-pandemic, and I want to say something at the end about what's happened post-pandemic. But other kinds of inequalities are as or more important. And I've got sort of one message that I want to get across today. It's to do with that, that we shouldn't always be thinking of inequalities in income and wealth. They're incredibly important, but there are lots of other inequalities that are as important. Now, the philosopher Elizabeth Anderson has argued that the important things are relational inequalities, inequalities between people, and the extent to which people standing as democratic equals, um, that is what we want. That's the equality that we want. Um, and those other kinds of inequality are important only insofar as they threaten that or they change that. So this leads to more of a focus on institutions, on fairness and justice, and also on groups. Um, think of men and women. Um, Cornell talked about black and white, a um, big issue in the US. Um, and I'm going to talk quite a lot about college educated versus not. And if these two groups are not equal citizens of equal standing in some respect or another, then Anderson would argue that we have a problem. And I agree with her. So let me turn to deaths of despair. Um, Anne Case and I define deaths of despair as deaths from accidental drug overdose, from suicide, and from alcoholic liver disease. Those have risen rapidly in the US since the mid 90s. There were 158,000 of them in 2017 and in 2018. Of course, there are suicides, drug overdoses, and alcoholic liver disease deaths in normal times. You can think of the normal as perhaps between 60,000. So about 100,000 excess deaths a year from these three um, categories. Um, there are two very surprising and important inequalities here. Um, the increase is the same for men and women. It's not just a male phenomenon. And it's been extraordinary in when people written about our work in the press. They assume it's all got to be men because the prejudice about people taking drugs is they're men, they're rural, um, and so on. It's not just a male phenomenon. These have increased in parallel for men and women. There are more for men than for women, but they've increased in parallel. The increase is almost entirely confined to those without a four-year college degree. Now, just important fact to keep in mind when you're thinking about this is only a third of both men and women, adult men and women in the United States, have a college degree. So the, 
that third is pretty much exempt from this increase in deaths of despair. We argue that a declining labor market for the less educated is key here. And the key argument is that the failing labor market brought social dysfunction in many forms. Here's one of the more um, impressive pictures um, in our book, uh, though it's been updated. Um, these divide the left-hand side of people without a BA, um, people on the right-hand side of the BA. And the main thing you want to get here is just if you look at this picture, the one on the right for the people with a BA looks completely different from the one on the left for people with a BA. If you look at the one on the left, um, these are drawn by birth cohorts. Um, and if you look at the birth cohort of 1940, then this goes is flat as they aged from 50 when we first see them until 80. Um, there's been very little increase in deaths of despair. For the 45 cohort, which is my birth cohort, there's not much change either. For 50, you begin to see it rise. It's 55, 60, 65. And then you can see that these younger cohorts today are these, that each curve is higher than the previous one, more deaths of despair. But it's also rotating up so the effects of age get worse and worse over time. Now, some of this is obviously the opioid epidemic. There are time trends in there, which one could take out. But the main thing to see is that it's getting worse for younger Americans. Didn't really affect the older Americans, people my age or older. Um, and it doesn't affect people with a BA. So that's just to give you an impression of what's happening with these things. Here's some stuff from the labor market. These are the employment population ratios. Unemployment has become a really bad indicator of what's going on because it's conditioned on people looking for work. Um, these are just give the employment to population ratio of white non-Hispanic men and women aged 25 to 54. And what you can see here is if you take the men with a BA or more, this is pretty flat. Um, but for men with less than a BA, there's a downward trend from 1980. Every time there's a boom um, in, with the business cycle, it ticks up, but then it goes down. It never gets back up to where it was before. So there's a steady downward trend of separation of people without a BA from the labor market over time. For women, it's a little bit different because there's this big increase in female participation in the labor force, but that stops after 2000. After that, the women behave sort of like the men, depending on whether they have a BA or not. If you look at weight, sorry, if you look at life expectancy at age 25, to me, this is sort of a sensational picture, and I don't think it's got the traction that it perhaps should have. This doesn't come from our book, this comes from a later paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences earlier this year. Um, this shows how long you can expect to live at age 25. So, you know, these numbers are like 60 or something because you've used up 25 years of your life already. And they separate between women on the right, men on the left, um, blacks um, and whites. Um, and BA and non-BA. So the BAs are the dotted ones and the non-BA are the solid lines. Let's start with the women. Um, if you look at white women without a BA, that life expectancy has been falling since 1990, um, really doing really badly. White men without a BA, it rose a little bit, but it's been falling since about 2010. If you look at the, the main part of this picture, however, is that if you look at whites and blacks, if you look over here, say, start with men, the whites and blacks with no BA were very widely separated in 1990. Um, the whites um, with a BA and the blacks with a BA were very widely separated. But nowadays in 2010, the blacks with and, with, and whites with a BA are quite close to one another, similar for women. And the whites and blacks without a BA are quite close together. And they're both further away from the people who have a BA. So what you're seeing here is there's this thing that's gone on forever, ever since we've data, that blacks have shorter lifespan than whites. However, what is happening here is that education is becoming more important 
and race is becoming relatively less important. I'm certainly not arguing these differences have gone away. Blacks have shorter lives than whites, but the BA is becoming way more important than um, it was. So I think I've told you this, but just let me go through the slide just in case. Class, education, if you like, is becoming more important relative to race. Women have gained less than men. That's a well-known thing. It's just because women, a lot of the progress in the last part of the 20th century um, came from um, treating heart disease and stopping people dying from heart disease. But women didn't die from it very much anyway. And so they made much less benefit. Smoking was also important there. So blacks do worse than whites, conditional on education. Blacks are also less likely to have a VA, which expands this further. Hispanics who are not shown in this picture do better than whites or blacks. And the pandemic has changed this, which we'll see in a bit. So this divide between BA and not shows up across many aspects of life. And that's the wider story that I wanna to tell today into politics, into morbidity, into lots of things. So increasing pain is a really important thing. We now have an astonishing thing in America that if you look at people in midlife, they're in more pain than the elderly. Well, as an elderly person myself, I can tell you that pain increases with age. So how is it possible that people in midlife have more pain than people in old age? Well, it's because they've had more pain throughout their lives and each birth cord is having more and more pain. Other things, pain is going up, socializing is going down, self-reported health is going down, disability, all worse things, but only for the less educated. Family life is in bad shapes, declining marriage rates, again, for the less educated. Patterns of serial cohabitation and childbearing so that people have these very fragile families, and the term comes from my colleague, Sarah McClanahan, um, that what happens is that people don't get married um, largely because the man has such poor prospects, but it doesn't stop them having kids. And then the woman finds some guy who has better prospects, she moves on to him and has more kids. And then you get these series of, of fragmented, fragile families, which are really very bad um, for people's satisfaction, for um, the meaning of having a good life. There are no unions anymore. They're close to eliminated in the private sector. Um, unions played a big role in local social life. Um, Bob Putnam's famous guy that was bowling alone was bowling in a union hall and the union had sort of gone away. The unions improved working conditions. They monitored working conditions. They raised wages, even for those who were not in unions. And they were very important politically in providing political representation for people in local towns, um, in state legislatures, and in Washington too. Church going has declined among those without a VA. And there's a huge amount of isolation and detachment of less educated Americans from the institutions that support a good life. My colleague Kathy Eden here in the social department has done wonderful work um, on that. <coughs> Excuse me. The Harvard philosopher and political scientist Michael Sandal has argued that BA has today become a condition for a good job, for respect, and for social esteem. Good jobs for less educated Americans have become scarcer. We all know the stories about robots and globalization, of which robots are probably most important. Anne and I have written about the increasing cost of health care. Um, much of it is funded by um, employers paying um, health benefits, health insurance for their workers. That's effectively a flat tax um, because, you know, every worker, the insurance doesn't vary very much with people's incomes. And so it's a huge effect on making less educated, less skilled labor more um, expensive. Um, coal mines or steelworks have been replaced by Amazon fulfillment centers. That's not just true in the U.S. Um, the Amazon Fulfillment Center is safer. It may or may not pay more, but it doesn't come with the social respect, the social support, the community that came with the former. 
political influences declined. I've talked about unions, but there's also enormous growth in lobbying by firms in Washington. You may think that that was always true, but it really wasn't. Most of that growth has taken place in Washington since 1970. And 1970 is the sort of date where the um, everything starts going bad for the working class um, in America. Most of whom who now believe that the system is rigged in favor of a cosmopolitan educated elite like people like me um, that is benefiting from globalization while they lose. Expanding opportunities for upward redistribution. Think of all these hedge fund managers who are buying up um, um, end of life coal um, coal mines and gutting out the pension scheme supported by the courts. So we're coming back to the Anderson type of relational um, inequality that we've now got a two class society between those with four year college degrees and those without meaningful jobs with prospects and benefits versus service jobs without the increasing influence of money in DC since 1970 has been well documented by political scientists. So there's little influence in Washington of concerns of less wealthy constituents, not just in votes where it's been well documented, but also in agenda setting. I mean, those issues just don't come up. The legal profession has slowly moved, being well documented, moved towards a pro business stance. Um, there's increasing belief in efficiency as a sort of justice and paying little attention to distributional issues. There's less attention to monopoly and monopsony than there used to be. And it makes it easier for widespread upward redistribution. You know, think of a monopolist that's increasing prices. Um, it um, reduces the salaries of its customers um, at the expense of its shareholders and its um, managers. One thing that I think is incredibly important and we've not given enough attention to is our wars are fought by enlisted men and women who do not have college degrees, um, unlike the officers who are college educated, um, but not other ranks. This violates democratic equality, and I think that's more serious even than income inequality. Many people have noted that we get forever wars when we have other people to fight them for us. If it was our sons and daughters, the sons and daughters of the educated elite who were fighting in those wars as enlisted men, these would not really. So capitalism is less constrained by democratic and social norms than once was the case. I love this quote of Adam Smith, who as often saw many things before. He says, the cruelest of our revenue laws I will venture to affirm are mild and gentle in comparison with some of those which the clamor of our merchants and manufacturers extorted from the legislature for the support of their own absurd and oppressive monopolies. Like the laws of Draco, these laws may be said to be all written in blood. Draco was an Athenian legislature legislate poor who had a very simple penal code which is if you did anything wrong you died uh, that's where the word draconian comes from i want to just say something about politics i i find this perhaps more fascinating than i ought to um this shows life expectancy of birth across the 50 states um, of the u.s um on the um x on the yeah on the x-axis it shows the Republican share um, in the presidential election of 2016. And what you can see is that the um, poor states, sorry, the, um, not the poor states, the six states um, at the bottom here, all are solidly Republican and the healthy states are solidly Democratic. Well, if you think that's um, <laughs> always been true, it's just not true. Um, that's not true. If you look here, this is each presidential election. And I've looked at the Republican vote share in each of these presidential elections um, on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis is life expectancy at 25, adult life expectancy. So you can see when Jerry Ford 
um, was beaten by um, Jimmy Carter, there's, the slope is actually positive. Um, and so it was the states that were healthier and longer lived um, who voted Republican and the poorer ones voted Democratic. By about 1988, Bush versus Dukakis, it's pretty much flat in here too. And then it begins to sort of, you get George Bush versus Gore, Bush versus Kerry, McCain versus Obama, Romney, Obama, Trump and Clinton, and Trump and Biden. So this Venus rotation, and you know, we're writing about this elsewhere as to the details of how this happened. But basically, as jobs were lost, as the working class was destroyed, the working class moved Republican and away from Democrats, who they saw as not having helped them at all. The after 1968, the Democrats too pretty much moved deliberately away from the working class and towards a coalition of educated elites and minorities. So you've got this horrible um, correlation um, between politics and health. And of course, with red state governors now encouraging people not to wear masks and not to get vaccinated, this is going to get stronger still. Let me say a few words about COVID before I stop. Um, a lot of this, I think, is familiar. Um, the, the VA divide um, got, you know, became even more important, both incomes and health. Um, essential workers had to go to work um, versus people like you and me who could work at home on Zoom. Um, so they had a choice between their money, their salary, and their health, or losing both, um, whereas um, people who could work at home did not. Um, if you look at unemployment and the EPOP ratio again, recessions are usually worse for men, um, but in COVID it was worse for women, presumably because of the role in childcare, education, and the distribution of jobs. School closures, distance learning, had bad effects, especially for poorer children, um, sort of baking in inequalities for years to come. And there are much higher death rates among Blacks, Hispanics, and AIAN, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, dying at disproportional rates. The distribution of work and living conditions, some of it's geography, some of it's racism, some of it's overcrowding. <clears throat> and these worst Hispanic outcomes did not exist pre-pandemic. So that was a real change. But here's this sort of, Anne and I have been doing some work on this, that if you look at the COVID deaths, um, the BA has been, as you might expect, very protected against COVID deaths and excess deaths. So that for whites age 25 to 64, the BA is 75% effective against dying from COVID. So it works like a vaccine. If you're an adult 25 to 64, having a BA basically gives you 75% protection against dying from COVID. The stunning thing though, is if you look at the ratio of deaths for those with a BA and without a BA, it didn't change very much in 1920 compared, sorry, it didn't change very much in 2020 with COVID from 2019 without COVID. So you might have thought that's really weird. What, how, how did all these people without a VA, they put at risk in a way that they really weren't before? Working in a supermarket or a meatpacking plant or hospital orderly didn't used to be as dangerous as the way it is now. But what's actually happened is that the risk, the relative risks were about as high before as they were during. Um, they both went up. Um, but it went up more or less in proportion. So the ratio of mortality per BA to non-BA was about the same as it was um, before. So, um, close to being done here. Um, Alex Azar, the health secretary in the Trump administration argued against lockdowns early in the pandemic because he thought they would kill people through deaths of despair. Well, it's interesting to look and see if that was true. Um, and, you know, we don't have all the data. Normally, all the data on deaths come in about a year and a half later. So, you know, we're, we're working with um, provisional data all the time. 
We know that suicides actually declined in 2020 over 2019, um, which is somewhat surprising. Um, and indeed the relationship between suicide and unemployment broke down during the Great Recession and the unemployment and fall in employment during 2020 did not generate a spike in suicide. So that we know. Drug overdoses did increase a lot during the pandemic, but they were increasing rapidly in the months prior to the pandemic. A lot of this is because fentanyl, which is the latest illegally supplied opioid that's killing people, has been spreading westward from the eastern United States to California and elsewhere. Um, and so that was happening before the pandemic and it went on during the pandemic. And then towards the end of 2020, the number of monthly drug overdose deaths began to fall quite rapidly for reasons we don't understand. Um, we don't know much about alcohol deaths yet, um, but many, many people are worried. I put the word quarantinis here. Um, there are many stories about people buying in large amounts of liquor um, during the pandemic. We don't know whether that's just replacing what they would have drunk at bars. Um, or whether there's something in the pandemic that turned people towards alcohol. So this is really the last thing I want to talk about. So come back to this wealth inequality that I talked about at the beginning. Um, the U.S. spot market is at all-time highs during the pandemic. And the Dow is above 30,000 for the first time ever. It was 35,186 today, the last time I looked. Um, <laughs> And the less educated and minorities are suffering, they're dying, while rich and those with pensions in the market, which means people like us, get enormously richer during the pandemic. Now, according to some account, Bezos made $90 billion during the pandemic, plus $68 million, Zuckerberg $47 billion. And I don't know how often uh, those of you who are faculty check your TIA graphic accounts or however you um, keep your pension funds, there have been big increases there. Now, this is a very weird thing that the stock market would go through the roof um, during a pandemic. Some of it is due to low interest rates, but much of it is due to the fact that the big tech companies are American and not British. There's been no boom in the British stock market, for example. This makes one think that maybe there's something to be said for wealth taxes. There's obviously big issues about funding um, the pandemic and left to themselves, at least conservative politicians would prefer to cut benefits, um, have austerity. Um, I don't have the expertise or time to talk about a wealth tax, but it's been seriously discussed in Britain, for example, um, and it really is a big issue. Um, the IMF has actually been suggesting a one-time levy um, to help pay for uh, COVID. There's a permanent shift towards tech. I mean, obviously it was exaggerated by the pandemic, but it's obviously not going to go away. We're not going to stop buying things from Amazon. Um, we're not going to stop watching Netflix. Um, and so the stock market, which values profits, not wages. Many people think the stock market is an indicator of the economy, but it's not. It's an indicator of profits. And the declining labor share, which has been going on for a long time, um, can really be expected to continue, big tech to get bigger. And so this wealth is going to go up. Now, if you look at what happened historically after the Second World War, um, most um, countries that were um, belligerents in, in the war or were involved in the war had very, very high taxes post-war in order to recoup some of the huge amounts of money being made by manufacturers during um, the war. I wanted to show you this picture. Um, I can't see the top end of it, but this to me is a stunning picture. This comes from, I didn't draw this picture, um, the Board of Governors of the Fed. Um, and the survey of consumer finances through this picture. And what it shows is total wealth and trillions of dollars um, in the US from 2006 up to the first quarter of 2021. 
Um, and it's this is total wealth, so it includes pensions, it includes housing, it deducts um, it deducts um, debts and all the rest of it. And what you can see here is this enormous increasing share of wealth that belongs to the people um, who have a college degree, and pretty much flat for those that don't. Shift down here, this is shares, and I can take this, the, the, the Fed's allow us to take back, this back to 1990. You can see that in 1990, wealth was equally shared between those who had a college degree and those who didn't have a college degree. It's now, that number there is now um, 72 or 73%. So it's gone from being 50-50 to three to one um, in the um, what has happened to college educated wealth. So <laughs> they're not just, their wages are not just going up, their lives are getting better and their wealth is going up by just a huge amount. Um, and they're also by and large voting Democrat, which is interesting if you think about it. Just to show this as a contrast, this is the wealth distribution by percentiles of income. And you can see, I, I don't want to discuss this, I just wanted to show that this is not nearly as impressive as what's happening here. So the big changes here are what's happening to wealth and education, um, not wealth between people with high and low income. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to turn off my screen sharing now, and I'm happy to take some questions. And back to Cornell. All right. Well, thank you very much. You gave us a lot to think about there, and we have some questions coming in already. I think I'm going to start uh, with asking you a little bit about uh, your focus on the inequality between those with higher educations and those without higher educations. Um, and I suspect many Americans would say, well, this isn't such a bad thing. After all, we tell our, our children, go to, go to university, become uh, doctors or become uh, engineers, uh, because that's what we want. And we think it, will, it, it, it represents a, a meritocracy rather than a caste system or something like that, as long as higher education re remains accessible to all. So uh, our, I wonder if you can say a little bit about this idea of meritocracy and whether you see it as a problem in American culture or, or not. I think it's a huge problem. And I think, you know, I'm a meritocrat. You're probably a meritocrat too. I mean, my parents weren't very wealthy. Um, and, you know, I had opportunities and I passed a lot of exams and, you know, everything sort of followed from there. And, you know, we were brought up thinking that was a really good thing. It was much better than giving everything to the dukes and landowners and everything else who didn't know anything. And there's obviously good things about meritocracy. I mean, you actually probably want the guy who's flying your airplane to know how to fly an airplane. Um, and, you know, there's an efficiency aspect to it that's really very, very important. But there's a very dark side to it, too, um, which is that, first of all, the numericocrats become extremely smug and they think, well, you had the opportunity too. So if you screwed up, you know, that's your fault. Right? You had the same chance as I did, which may or may not be true because uh, parents, meritocratic parents are very good at passing the meritocracy onto their children. And as for the people who are left behind, you know, <laughs> what are they supposed to think? Um, you know, it was my fault. Well, they think the system's rigged. Um, they don't think they had a fair chance. And some of them may, of course, think that the smug, successful meritocrats are right. And it is part of their own fault. So you get that mixture of, you know, self, <laughs> self blame and believing you're in a rigged system, which leaves a lot of people very, very angry. So it's great that everybody who can go to college should be able to go to college. And, you know, through a lot of rent seeking and other things, colleges have become very expensive in the United States. But nonetheless, the return is about 70 to 80% today from having a college degree. And in spite of the enormous expansion, the returns keep going up. But only a third of people have college degrees. So what about the other two thirds? Is our education system just leaving them on? Is it not true that they can't do anything? Um, you know, are they just, are we just going to turn our backs on them? 
And I think we need a system that provides many more educational routes for people that are suited to their abilities and tastes um, so that you can have dignified work, um, worthwhile work, a good life without necessarily having a college degree and joining this educational league. It's also probably true that a tremendous number of these jobs that you require BA, you don't really require BA for. <laughs> you know, and I know the, the CEO Merck was saying the other day that um, he believed that Merck should open up its hiring to a much wider range of people and find people who can do what they need them to do and not necessarily filter on BA at the first state. So it's not like a BA is knowing how to fly an airplane. Um, a BA is, you know, a sorting device that's creating a lot of very angry uh, people many of them turning towards Donald Trump and to other populist solutions, which are not going to help us very much, or them, I think. Okay. Uh, one of our listeners, Larry Fox, asks whether the income pie is finite. Uh, does Jeff Bezos's increase in income diminish my opportunity to earn? Right. So that's a really, really good question. And that gets very close to the solar center of things. And it was like that quote I started with at the beginning, you know, the, if Bezos gets more, the rest of us get less, which is true of the pie, but it's, you know. So I'm a real believer in, you know, in, in um, the way that capitalism works, the way that innovators get paid enormous sums of money. Um, and, you know, those are the incentives that allow us all to get rich. And it's a sort of Schumpeterian creative destruction. Um, and, you know, if just be the, the argument would then typically be, well, if Jeff Bezos made these wonderful things for us, um, if Apple made these wonderful things for us, then those inventors should be incentivized and they should get enormous rewards. I think during the pandemic, um, people have been really wondering about that. You know, how much is okay? Does Jeff Bezos really need another hundred billion? You know, so where, where do we... I mean, I think a lot of people were really quite upset when um, Jeff Bezos came back from the space craft, space flight, and said, I want to thank the customers and employees of Amazon for this. You paid for it. Um, and there's a real suggestion that maybe enough is enough. Um, you know, the, the, um, during the Second World War in Britain, um, where they had conscription as they did in America too. So people were had a draft. So ordinary working people had to go to war and risk their lives. They didn't want a huge tax. They didn't want to stop the people who were making the bombs, who were making the guns, who were making the munitions from producing at full tilt, right? So what they did was they had very high taxes on those people during the war. So Jeff Bezos and, and the Labour Party said that it wanted a conscription of capital to match the conscription of labor. I mean, a very nice um, phrase, I think. So Jeff Bezos got rich because of the pandemic. Got, sorry, Jeff Bezos got richer, 100 billion richer, because of the pandemic. That pandemic killed about 600,000 people in the United States. Is that okay? Um, if you're a believer like me, that people like Bezos or Gates who invent stuff should be richly rewarded, how much is enough? How much do we want to give them? How much do we expect them to contribute when other people are dying and they're benefiting from other people's deaths? Right. I wonder if we zoom out, you know, the uh, uh, social philosopher Steven Pinker makes an argument that much of the inequality and wealth that's emerged in the last 40 years, 50 years has come about as a result of globalization and technology. And that has driven up our, our ability to produce more, to, to be much more productive. Uh, and his argument is that if you look at this globally, that has then led to a dramatic decline in the number of people globally who live in absolute poverty, a tremendous increase in the number of people who live in the middle class, so that even though re relational inequality has increased, absolute uh, deprivation has decreased as well. So his argument is there's a moral trade-off here. 
And I wonder if you see it in the same way or, or different. I do. I mean, that's what a lot of my uh, Great Escape book is about, which is arguing precisely that. But, you know, that was, <laughs> I think I was sort of by that argument until when COVID came. And then if you double all those guys' wealth because 600,000 people have died, is that okay? I mean, you know, I know that a lot of people in China were moved out of poverty um, by, you know, the market mechanism. And a lot of that came about through increasing inequality, which I'm happy about. But at some point, you might think it has to stop. And the point at which it has to stop is when you've got a very large number of Americans who are completely shut out of the political process. Um, and, you know, they get very angry and they start breaking things. So that, you know, a very good example, again, if you read my friend Philippe Aguillon um, on this, you have this Schumpeterian creative destruction. These people come along, they get incredibly rich, right? But what you gotta make sure is they you don't let them stifle the next generation of innovators who are gonna come along afterwards. So think of Google. Um, you know, Google was all our favorite company. They all had this logo which said, do no evil, all the rest of it. We're the good guys, everybody else is the bad guys. They said, we're never gonna do any lobbying. We don't believe in that stuff. We're entrepreneurs who invent things. We're genius engineers. We're gonna make ourselves rich and make everybody on the planet better off, which they did. They're now the biggest lobbyists in Washington um, on a huge scale. Um, if you add up all the union lobbies in Washington, they don't add up to anything like what Google spends in every year. So you've got this phenomenon that these rich guys are now getting rich, not by making stuff anymore. They're getting rich by rent seeking and by stifling um, the political debate. And you know, if, if the Republican party is representing business and the Democrats are representing the educated elite and minorities, Who's left there to represent the white working class? And the answer is, well, there was a big hole there and Donald Trump looked right into it. So you talk, uh, I wonder if you'd say a little bit about what you see as, as possible remedies or uh, solutions or ways to address this problem of inequality, the type of inequality we have today. You talked a little bit about a wealth tax. Others have suggested things like a universal basic income, uh, obviously, there's uh, arguments about, you know, national health insurance. Uh, what do you see as the most important thing we should be looking at right now politically in terms of policymaking? Well, I, I don't believe in a, a universal basic income for the reasons that I've talked about um, in the book. I think the best work on UBI, um, it's very interesting. People um, like Philip Van Paris has written, I think, the best book on UBI. He actually advocates it because it enables people not to work. You know, once politicians in America understand that, they turn tail and run. Um, and in fact, most of the advocates today for UBI are arguing that it won't have that effect. So we're in this crazy situation. Also, someone has to pay for it. And, you know, lots of hardworking people who may not like their work all that much. Um, are being forced to pay up for those things. So I'm not in favor of a UBI. I am in favor of universal health care because I think what we have right now is a giant rent-seeking mess that's enriching a lot of very rich people at the, and is contributing enormously um, to the problems that workers have because it's increasing the cost enormously, maybe by 30 or 40% of hiring a less educated worker. So I think that's, and also everything, almost until COVID came, almost everything that was wrong with the federal budget looking into the future um, was to do with healthcare. And we're spending twice as much as we should, and it's all a redistribution from relatively poor people to relatively rich people. It's also stopping state, um, state governments um, from spending as much as they used to do um, on education because they have to pay enormous sums of money for Medicare and Medicaid that, that, that is not under their control. Um, I think, you know, if, if you go back to some of the historians believe you only solve problems like this through revolution and warfare. So that's 
certainly not advocating that, but that is the pessimistic um, view um, of, of these things. Um, and, but you know, you can't split your citizens into two groups that don't talk to one another, and don't trust each other um, without dire consequences. Uh, you know, some people think we're on the verge of a civil war. So I have a question from one of our YouTube uh, viewers. Uh, and the question is, they say, uh, David Harvey has suggested that neoliberal global capitalism is a project designed to benefit global elites, especially in the North. Uh, accumulation by dispossession has, he says, distributed global wealth through privatization, commodification, uh, manufactured crises, financialization, and state redistributions through taxes that benefit the wealthy and corporations. How far do you think this explains the level of inequality that we see in the United States today? Hey, I don't think about things that way. Uh, that seems to me a lot of long words that I don't know what or understand. Uh, and I take it back to the thing you said at the beginning, that um, globalization has benefited you know, has the biggest poverty reduction program in world history um, over the shortest possible time. So, of course, it benefited a lot of people, a lot of rich people, um, but it also benefited a lot of poor people too. But it hasn't benefited many less educated people in rich countries. So, I mean, in some sense, um, you know, the white working class in the United States has lost out to the much poorer working class in China that has gone, and even in India to some extent. Now, one of the things that really pisses people off is if sort of globalized intellectuals like us turn to these people and say, well, those people are much poorer than you were. And so the world is a much better place if you suffer a little bit so that they can get better off. But I mean, I think these stories that globalization has hurt everybody are just you know, fairy stories of the left. I don't believe them. Uh, another question from a YouTube viewer. Do you think that a higher minimum wage uh, helps address economic inequality? Yes, I do. I think it will have some negative employment effects, but it have much larger income effects and the negative employment effects yeah. will be um, quite minor. There's been really important work done in that in the last four or five years. Um, uh, Mr. Dube at UMass at Amherst has a very, very careful paper, which I think is the most careful work that's been done on this. And remember, what's happened is um, the minimum wages, even though the federal minimum wage hasn't changed um, for a long time, since I guess 2009, I, I, that may be wrong. Um, many, many states have increased their minimum wages. And so you have a lot of increases in minimum wages of different amount all over the country, which have been going on. And you can look and study the consequences. And you know that's been a very fought over issue in economics and in political science. Um, but I think the results are pretty clear that the, the employment effects are quite modest and the income effects can be quite large. Mind you, a shortage of labor really helps too. And that's what we seem to have right now. And, you know, this $15 an hour has become a sort of focal point. So you see it in fast food restaurants, you see it in airport gift shops, all sorts of things. And that, um, that, that really helps. Might be one of the positive uh, consequences of COVID, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I, I wonder, you know, part of the argument is that the, the old working class, um, uh, lower uh, education level working class, their jobs have gone away and their jobs yeah. have gone away because of globalization, but also mostly because of technology. Yeah. Um, and so the problem is not so much that they're living in poverty, but it's more about self-esteem at this point and, and how our society values uh, these folks. And, and the, my question is this, you know, if, if the types of jobs that they performed in the past really are no longer necessary for our economy, what's the answer there? Uh, are there are there really jobs that can be created uh, for those who have lower uh, education levels that would give them self-esteem today? Well, two answers that one is that in Germany, for example, um, Holland or other places where they've got very 
jobs that carry a lot of respect that don't necessarily involve high levels of education, for instance. So, and my friend Darren Asmoglu, I think, would also argue that, um, you know, the, the way that technology, the way that automation is happening is something that can be under our control. And so you don't want to think of this as handloom weavers being replaced by machines, that we could, um, the technology could be, the, the way in which technology is adopted depends on politics, it depends on wages, it depends on many other things. And also, so we have things like now, right, the way healthcare is funded. You know, if you have to pay $20,000 a year as an employer to hire one of these workers, then replacing it with a robot is, is an absolutely obvious thing to do. If you don't have to pay anything for that, replacing them by a robot becomes much less attractive. Secondly, you can have robots that work with people as well as robots that work against people. So there's a whole range of technologies which can actually um, use labor better and not have this simple idea that you know these jobs have gone away. I mean, we're also um, giving tax incentives for people to mechanize which seems like a completely crazy thing to do under these circumstances. So, you know, and I think there's a lot we can do there, um, which would make it not so um, unpleasant. Okay, well, I'm afraid our, our time has come to an end. Uh, before I uh, thank our guest, let me remind our listeners uh, and viewers today that uh, our next uh, event in this series is next Wednesday, September 15th. Uh, we have Professor Bruno Baltadano from Florida State College discussing inequality in B Bolivia, elections, and indigenous self-determination. So I hope you'll join us for that. Now I want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in today. I hope you, we see you next week. And I especially want to thank uh, Sir Angus Deaton for a terrific discussion uh, and uh, something that we've all, uh, it'll give us something uh, to think about, I'm sure, for some time to come. Thanks, Angus. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it. I'm sorry for the technical glitch at the beginning. That's not a problem. Part of my fault. Thanks. We'll see you all next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.